the story of communications by post, telegraph, telephone, and radio is a fascinating study of mechanical development. A story made possible by the vision of the engineer in the field and in the laboratory. Today, a hand lifts a telephone receiver while a finger twirls the dial of an automatic phone. In less time than it takes to tell, two people are in speech contact. Distance is eliminated. The handicaps of the past exist no more. Although as early as 1859, Tasmania was linked to the mainland of Australia by a cable laid across Bass Strait, this could be used only for telegraphic communication. With the laying of a new submarine cable, the post office achieved its ambition of linking by telephone all the states of the Commonwealth and making available to the people of Tasmania and King Island facilities which had long been enjoyed by residents in other parts of the Commonwealth. Many months of intensive research preceded the placing of the order for the necessary cable with Messrs. Siemens Brothers in England. Three repeater stations were erected at Apollo Bay, King Island and Perkins Bay and equipment installed in readiness for the great adventure. This was to be the longest cable of its kind and the most modern in the world and the eyes of all communication authorities as well as the engineering world were upon Australia as the task was commenced. The route followed runs from Apollo Bay, Victoria to King Island, thence to Perkins Bay near Stanley, Tasmania. Land lines connect the cable to Melbourne and Hobart respectively. Preliminary arrangements and the plotting of the course which the cable was to follow had earlier been made by skilled post office engineers. The Faraday arrived in Australian waters with more than 161 nautical miles of submarine cable carefully stowed in four circular tanks beneath her hatches and was immediately taken to Apollo Bay. Here a close inspection was made of the spot at which the Victorian end of the cable was to be brought ashore. The ship then proceeded to King Island on a similar quest, while at Apollo Bay work at once commenced on the digging of a trench from the beach to the repeater station. In this trench, the shore end of the cable was to be laid. Installed in the repeater station is intricate equipment for the amplification of the current passing through the cable, so that it will reach its destination without loss of strength. The Faraday then returned to Apollo Bay, placing marker buoys at intervals of five miles to facilitate the laying of the cable on the return journey. These buoys are fitted with an ingenious timing device which lights a lamp at sunset and automatically switches it off at sunrise and so warns shipping of their presence during the night. To land the shore ends of the cable and pull them to the repeater station, the ship's own hauling gear was used. Two sand anchors were buried in the beach about 60 yards apart and pulley blocks made fast to them. The sand anchor consisted of a heavy flat wooden structure which was buried to a depth of about four feet. Chains fastened to the board were brought to the surface and to these chains were attached the pulley blocks round which the hauling rope travelled. From the stern of the ship a rope passed through the pulley blocks and thence to the winch on the bow. The cable was attached to the stern end, the winch operated and slowly the cable was drawn ashore. Drums were affixed to the cable at intervals to float it ashore, thus keeping it off the seabed and reducing the strain. When sufficient length was ashore, these drums were cut off and the cable sank to its allotted place on the bed of the ocean. With the Victorian end laid in the trench and connected in the repeater station, the anchor was weighed and the ship commenced laying the first section of the cable. Rolling to a long steady swell, mile after mile of cable rippled steadily from the tanks to the blue depths of Bass Strait. 
history was being made, and the post office ideal of years was well underway. The cable, for technical reasons, was laid in four links. When approximately half the distance between Apollo Bay and King Island, constituting the northern section, had been laid, the cable end was void. King Island, the cable was floated ashore in a manner similar to that at Apollo Bay, and the ship then moved back over her route whilst laying the second length of the northern section. When the intermediate spot was reached, the two ends were joined and dropped in 50 fathoms of water. Then came the laying of the southern section from King Island to Perkins Bay. As the cable was laid, the strain to which it was being subjected was measured on a dynamometer. Engineers had previously calculated the point at which tension would become dangerous. After the two lengths forming the southern section were laid, the void ends were brought aboard the Faraday and the important work of making the final joint was carried out during the night in a heavy swell. The cable jointer is, of course, a specialist, as considerable care and long experience are necessary in the making of a joint which will for many years withstand the rigors of the seafloor. Although careful soundings are made to avoid deep sea valleys or precipices, the ocean bed with its jagged rocks, marine growth, and all the rest of King Neptune's goods and chattels provides a formidable problem for the engineer. The slightest weakness in a joint and the work of months may have to be done all over again. But everything went well, and the completed cable was dropped over the side of the vessel at four o'clock in the morning in 32 fathoms of water, and so was established telephonic communication between Tasmania and the mainland. Anxious engineers and perspiring men alike heaved a sigh of relief. Another job was done successfully, but there was something more. Another link had been forged in that chain of post office communications which binds together the people of the Commonwealth and provides an outlet to the rest of the civilized world. Let us now look closely at this modern cable. This sectionalized view shows its components. As we examine it, we see the protective wire armoring. Then the jute yarn, which forms a bed for the armoring. Here is the copper return conductor, which is covered by a metal tape, which protects the, conduct the conductors from marine borers. In the center is the single copper conductor with a diameter of slightly more than one eighth of an inch. This is surrounded by an insulating layer of paragutta. The overall diameter of the cable, including the protective covering, is only an inch and a half. This unique cable allows no fewer than six telephone and seven high-speed telegraph channels and also one broadcast channel to be operated simultaneously. To the residents of Tasmania, more than 34 million telephone subscribers in practically every country of the world have been brought within reach. The vision of the past is the triumph of the present, made possible by the post office, Australia's national communication service. Put your beers on.